Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Greater Rochester Teen Book Festival, a full day book festival dedicated solely to teens. I am Elliot Gavin, a teen volunteer, and this session is Plotter or Pantser, the writing process. Before I introduce our plan panel, here are a few, few housekeeping details for our session. If you have a question for our panel, please put it in the chat. Please remain muted during our session and please turn your camera off. If you, are con if you are experiencing connectivity issues, please try to enter, um, refresh, your, refresh your page. It's also being recorded. Some fun facts about our first author is that she has a terrible sense of direction and writes her best work between 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. Her novel, One of Us is Lying, tells the story of a breakfast club group type of teenagers that get forced into the middle of a murder mystery. However, not everyone or everything is how it seems. Welcome, Karen McManus. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Our next author wrote for Mickey Mouse Club when Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, and Brian Gosling were all Musketeers and was born in Italy. His books follow diverse and relatable characters that go through some unbelievable situations, such as in his book series Frame that follows Florian, a curious 12-year-old boy who accidentally gets involved with the FBI after using the acronym TOAST, or Theory of All Small Things. Welcome, James Ponti. Our last author wrote her college admissions essay um, about Anne Martin's The Babysitter's Club and is originally from California. Her book, What Kind of Girl, explores team relationships and the harmful terror types that are put on girls. Please welcome Alyssa. Hello, Alyssa. Hey, everybody. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, so much for joining us. Um, our session uh, today is Plotter or Panster, uh, and I was hoping maybe somebody could start us off with a quick overview. What do those words mean in the writing world? Sure. So um, a plotter is, you know, like it sounds, somebody who plots out their story, whereas a pantser is more fly by the seat of your pants as you write. So going into it without necessarily knowing what's coming next. Thank you so much. So I think we have to start with just the basic question for each of our authors. Are you a plotter or a pantser? Alyssa, you want to go first? Oh, um, I am definitely, I'm kind of a little bit of both. I'm a plotter, I love my outlines, but I tend to start out as a pantser. So I will write the first, like, you know, between three and 10 chapters um, before I've necessarily made up my mind about what's going to happen. And that's kind of my chance to get to know the characters and the world and without the, you know, rules and um, confines of the plot you know, pushed on me again. And often those first five to 10 chapters that I write without a plot do not make it into the book. Um, although in some of them, they do, like in A Danger Yourself and others, I don't think that I wrote the first eight chapters before I plotted it, and I think they're almost exactly the same in the final book. Um, but in any event, so then I stop usually, you know, um, after a few chapters, and I will stop. I tend to write um, a synopsis, and then once I have a synopsis, I'll stop and turn that into a chapter by chapter outline. I I am, I wrote my first few books without an outline and, and having converted to being an outliner, I will never go back. It is a lovely, it, it's, you know, uh, there's a quote, oh gosh, I can't remember. I think it may have been Tolkien who said like, um, that he, or I can't remember the quote, but basically you need a map and the, the outline is my map so that I know where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, very similar to Alyssa. I did not start out as an outliner. Um, One of Us is Lying kind of came to me in a flash and I wrote it really fast. Um, and it, I thought it turned out okay. So I thought, I'm good at books. I don't have to outline. Um, and then I tried to write Two Can Keep a Secret and it was a nightmare. Um, and I realized not every idea is a bolt of lightning. Some of them are seedlings, you know, and they need time to develop. And I hadn't given it that time. So I am a reformed pantser. I'm a planter. Um, and I do spend a lot of time now um, 
writing out a pretty detailed outline. Um, I use this green writing tool called a beat sheet so that I can figure out the big moments and then how to connect them. But it does change a lot. I'd say the nice thing about an outline is it, it's, it makes sure you're gonna get where you're going, but you still have freedom to change direction. Uh, I, I too am part of the planter community. Um, I, I plotted the beginning, but not the second half. And that, that tends to be, um, uh, the, the first books I wrote had mystery elements in them. Uh, Dead City was a series about um, the society that produces the undead in New York. And I was worried that if I plotted it out, that I would give away the ending. So that mm -hmm. if I didn't know the ending, I couldn't give away the ending. So I just kept putting clues in. And then I had to solve the mystery along with the characters. And then I had to go back and, and make some of those work better when I, when I came to the solution. Um, but I, I, I'm a combination, but I, I don't outline like I should. Both of you point out that it's what you should do, and I'm just not smart enough, even though I know that, to do that. Just like I know I shouldn't eat as much chocolate as I do, but I still do. So I think I'm still resistant to plotting to a degree. But, you know, I think whatever works for you is the right way to do it. So I totally agree. There's no should about, like, I mean, so I don't know about you guys, but, like, sometimes I'll hear about tools that other writers use that I don't use, and I feel like, oh, my God, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but then I try to remember, okay, that's not my process. That's their process. Well, yeah. well one, thing that, one thing that Karen brought up that, that really touched for me was um, – the beat sheet. So my background is in screenwriting and television writing, and I majored in screenwriting in college. And beat sheets are really important, but almost even more important to that. In, in, in like when I work on a show with the writing staff, were index cards. So you have an idea, and you, you put it on an index card, and then you can lay them out on the table, and then you can lay them, and and then it becomes nonlinear because you can move. Oh wait, that idea should be over here. And eventually, now this sounds contradictory, I don't really outline, but as I get towards the end, I'm real anal retentive, and I do this. And so I do the chapters, each have a card, and they're color coordinated by character, and like they all have to use the same font and the same pen, and I realize like I use some all caps here, and upper and lowercase there, and I have to start over. So it gets into the rewriting is very much based that way. See, that is exactly the kind of thing when I see someone do that, I think, why don't I do that? That's so cool. <laughs> and don't do it. It's just not part of my process. It, 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 well, and what, what it helps me with that was written, because I have five main characters in this group that I have now. It's this team of five. And by color coordinating, I can look at it and I can say, oh, my goodness, if there's a kid out there that's a reader that likes cats, they're going to be so mad because she's not in like 80 pages. You know, she's there, her color is not cropping up. And so it, it helps me to see it all at once. And so that, that part helps. And, I, and I, I, I brought a little thing we were practicing before. I'm going to share something here if I do this right, which is only 50-50. Okay, so the book that I, that is the book that City Spice 3. And this is the outline for City Spice 3. So it'll start off really detailed and okay these are a plot and this is the thing and then i just add to this document as i go and, and like one of the things that i get really uptight about are um days losing track of days so i have to mark it you know, all these chapters happen on day one and all these chapters happen on day two and then all of a sudden it gets really vague <laughs> and then i'll get a hard point you know so this is like three weeks later i'll come and i'll write this thing about moscow and grocery stores in moscow and then you know um but what, what i did this time so this is the first book i ever wrote as an author whereas every other book i wrote i worked in tv during the day and i wrote at night on the weekend and i i, I bought these little whiteboards and um i put everyone's character arc on it so that I would, so I would not constantly remember. No way, you're supposed to be writing about that. So mm. I'm a little all over the place. Some place over plan, some place under plan. I love a peek into other writers' processes. It's funny what you say about time. I have a real problem with time. I mean, my other jokes with me that I have no concept of it. And anytime the copy 
editors get hold of my manuscript. It's just riddled with mistakes in terms of days and weeks and months. So I've started keeping a calendar now um, when I start a book. And when something happens, it goes on the calendar. And I'm constantly checking myself like, wait, was that really three days ago? No, it wasn't, Karen. It was three weeks ago. And trying to make their lives a little bit easier, but also my own. The, 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 the copy of the first book I wrote, it's like, you know, I, I, cause, cause I came from TV and in television, you write a TV series, it normally takes place over the course of a week, right? Because the next week is the next show. So you have a couple of days. And so, and so I would, well, books should be more than that. So I would have, well, three weeks later, they do this and all. And, then, and it's like, do you realize that this book started, I think, in like September and it's now like next March? I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> And you never mentioned Thanksgiving, Christmas, your birthday, the new year, the school, final exams or anything. I'm like, huh, okay. So calendar. So do you have like a desk calendar that you write in? Is that what you mean? Or like, um, no, I have like, I, I make like a Word document, you okay. know, and, and then I just like write in the date, the month and the things that happen. And I go back and I keep making sure that it all makes sense and it's could happen in that time frame because that's what, you know my editor will say to me can all that really happen in three days and i'm like maybe maybe it could okay it probably could <laughs> what are you Alyssa? do you do any of that kind of stuff and, and i think the time frame thing is a bit of a double-edged sword because i've written a couple books that do take place over a condensed time frame so only like um what kind of girl takes place over the course of eight days and in some ways that you know was part of the challenge was to fit all that action to eight days but it also was this great structure and these rules that I had set for myself of like things need to happen on a day by day basis. But then, you know, when I have other books where the action takes place over months, there is this sort of feeling that things are going on behind the scenes that maybe aren't going on the page. When you say like, you know, two weeks later X happened, well, you kind of know that, okay, in those two weeks, the action that happened two weeks prior was kind of breathing and settling and these characters were ruminating on it. And that's something you lose when you try to condense things into so it's, I, I actually, I, I like doing both. Like I quite enjoyed the challenge of fitting everything into an eight day arc. And I also think when I have a book that like that a month goes by, it's like, oh, there's so much more space now. And, and the outfits have changed. Now they have to wear scarves and things like that. When I, I remember at Nickelodeon, there's a writer who um, he said that 80% of his job was getting characters in and out of rooms. Like you know, <laughs> on a TV show, <laughs> You, you need that you need to have Uncle Jesse. I see that you rip out of the Uncle Jesse has to have his talk, and then yeah, and, and that's why, for instance, in TV shows, there's always these, there's always this moment where someone comes to a, like a restaurant and it's like, Oh, you were late, so I ordered for us, so the food's already here. Because we know in real life that's a 25 minute event of menus and this and that. And I find that part of outlining and plotting hard. It's like, how do I get these characters character together? And how do I break them apart? Do any of you struggle with that or deal with that? In my um, my fifth book, You'll Be the Death of Me, which is out in November, takes place over primarily over the course of 24 hours. Okay. And I thought to myself, this is going to be great for me, the person who has no concept of time, because I don't have to worry about days and weeks and months. Well, it turns out hours and minutes are also challenging, especially when people are moving around a city and you have to figure out, could they actually get there in this time? So I you know, got on the train and I took the same stops my characters were. I drove into downtown Boston and rushed out our traffic. I'm like, could we really get there? Let's just say they had optimal traffic conditions for most of the day. <laughs> that can happen though as long as it can happen sometimes it happens yeah. wow our, our, thank our, you for all those really amazing insights oh sorry go ahead no i just think you have questions i'm sorry <laughs> um i was just gonna ask if you could um give us a little bit more detail on like the timeline of a book so start us with like where does your inspiration come from and then a few of you mentioned you kind of write some of like a fast draft and then step back and do a little outlining and then write more. Can you tell us like how long does that process take and, and does it change from book to book? Um, for me, it's definitely different for every book. Um, it, it's, it's definitely not written in stone. It depends on obviously if I'm on deadline that, that changes the schedule significantly. Um, 
But I mean, my inspiration and ideas have come from so many different places. My my newest book, The Castle School for Troubled Girls, um, the spark of the idea came from the Twelve Dancing Princesses fairy tale. Um, even though the book is not magical, it's a contemporary realistic white you know fiction, but um, but that was just the initial spark. Um, a Danger to Herself and Others, the spark came from a tweet I saw one day. Somebody tweeted something um, that felt like a book idea to me, and so I turned it into a book. Um, so I think it can come from just about anywhere. And I think from that initial spark, like I said, I will tend to write like the first, you know, five to 10 chapters and then stop and outline. And um, and once I have the outline, I'll, once I have like a detailed outline, I can write a first draft relatively quickly. But a good friend of mine and I both call our outline drafts a trash draft. We don't count it as a real draft um, until we've had a chance to go back and reread it. And sometimes you know, to Karen's point earlier about how an outline, you know, is just a guideline, but you can go in different directions. I think sometimes when I'm following an outline, I'm going from beat to beat to beat, and I have to go back and be like, okay, that was too much going from one beat to the next, and I have to, I have to go back in and play a little bit more and let it, and let it breathe. So, so sorry, I didn't answer your question at all about how long that takes. I have no idea. It's different every time. Karen, what about you? You said you, you had that um, one of us is lying came to you in a thunderbolt. Did that write quickly? It did write quickly. Yeah, I tend to get ideas from a lot of times from other media when I'm just enjoying something else. So I heard the theme song from The Breakfast Club uh, while I was driving in my car and I started wondering what would have happened if somebody died during, you know, a moment like that. Um, and the idea just took off from there. When I was um, writing to for the cousins, I was reading a story about the Kennedy grandchildren um, and started wondering what it would be like for a family that was very powerful if that legacy got interrupted and the grandchildren did not have, you know, a life of privilege after all. So I tend to start with like these big ideas, but I don't know what they mean. And then I dive into characters, like who's actually involved, what do they want, how do they connect with each other, because I always write multi-POV, and I spend a lot of time building stories for the characters, and by the time I know that, I usually have a decent idea of like, what kind of crime would these people be involved in, and you know, what's, what are the actual plot mechanics that are going to fit around them, and that's when I start outlining. But if it's going well, um, the process can take a couple months. If it's not going so well, it can take, I think the longest it ever took me to draft a book was nine months. The, the, the thing that I find that's different is that it's, I rarely get the chance to just do start to finish on one because you're really finishing the other one and, you know, so so it gets, it gets well, people ask you, how long does it take to write a book? It's like, well, all in a row versus the course of, of the life of it. Um, because I usually write series books, the first one always takes the longest because um, I'll come up with the idea and I'll usually write 50 pages. And that's, say, a month, you know. And then as, as it happens, Karen and I have the same agent, Rosemary. And I'll, so I'll send Rosemary the 50 pages and say, like, so is, is there a book in this? What do you think? And, and, and she's actually really great about getting back to you quickly. But that, that waiting around. And then it's like we share it with an editor and then, and so I don't really get into writing it until maybe six months later if everyone says yes, but you're still finishing the last series. So like I, I went on a trip to Europe with my wife to visit our son when our son was in school in England for a year. And it was, it was the greatest week. We were in London, we're in Paris, and my wife is just like gaga everywhere she looks. And I'm like, I should, set a, I should set a book in London, Paris. How great would that be? And so I can't, I, that gave me the idea for what became Sid Inspired. But that trip was April of 2016, and the book came out March of 2020. So it was four years, of which the book was written a year and a half before it came out. You know, it, 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 so time, book time is different than any other time, although for Karen, maybe it's different because she also doesn't have a concept of time. But book time is different, you know, in, in that it stretches out over all the stuff. And um, so it, I would say for me, usually it's nine months, but that nine months may be spread out over two or three years. Awesome. Thank you. 
um, while you're working on your books, we, we had a question from a listener about um, the concept of a beat sheet. Can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe just generally like, how do you organize your plot, your characters, your world building as you go through different iterations of the story? I can start. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, a beat sheet, it's, it's really, it's a screenwriting tool. It's just an Excel document. Um, and you can download it and you can like, you know, customize it to your story, which is helpful. But what it does is it tells you all stories follow a similar pattern. You know, all stories have certain, should have certain moments that the audience or the reader will expect, you know. So at the beginning, you have a, you have your normal and then an inciting incident changes things. And then you have rising action as your protagonists like learn and understand what they're facing. You have a midpoint where you know, there's kind of no going back after the midpoint. You have falling action, you have a climax. So it helps you organize your thinking in terms of what are those moments for your characters. And you can actually spread them into, you can put them into the spreadsheet. They're kind of supposed to happen at certain points. I mean, again, you don't want to be too prescriptive because that is not, you know, very creative, but it's helpful, especially if you're um, a newer writer and you're not quite sure what your pacing should be like. It helps you with pacing. Um, so that's how I use it. I use it to identify and plot the big points. And then what I do, you know, in a different document is I figure out how do I get what happens between those points. And to me, those are often the most interesting moments because those, those are the character moments. You know, those are the moments when they're developing. So the, the beat sheet, the way I, so I, I majored in screenwriting in college. And one of my screenwriting teachers was a guy named Sid Field who wrote the, like the first real book about screenwriting called, called Screenplay. And he had his, his beat sheet was like this. I don't know if you can see, but it would, it, it would be like um, <laughs> this graph. And if, like she said, there, that's your start, that's your end of your first act, that's your midpoint, that's your climax, and this is your ending. And, and, and there's like the five key moments of a story. And then you would start to fill in between them. And I'll do that sometimes to try to figure out. If, because uh, the big problem with a lot of writing is this middle part. You have an idea in the beginning, you have an idea in the end, but the middle languishes. But what I found is like, you know, that, that every scene, every chapter should have one of these two. You know, so like in this chapter, what's my inciting moment? What's my turning point moment? What's my, and, so, and so you start almost like how when you take in geometry, the triangle, and you can do all the parallel lines and they're all smaller versions for the bigger whole. That may not make any sense at all, but that's how I try to, when I use beat sheets, what I do, but I, I rather than use a, a sheet like this, I usually use the next part so I can move them around. And that'll just be like, well, there are 10 things I know this book has to have. It has to have the, the moment they meet, the moment they find this clue, the moment this disappointment happens. Or, and then you can start, kind of like, the reason I like cards is I can sit at a table and I can spread those apart and think of, well, what's a really good way to connect from here to there? Or should this be over here? And once I move around, that, that really helps me a lot. Do you, do you use a beat sheet or anything like that, Alyssa? I don't, I, 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 I just use a Word document. And so I tend to start out with like bullet points of like, these are the things that I want to happen. And then the more that I could dig into it, the more the bullet points turn into paragraphs, turn into um, chapter by chapter beats. It kind of develops as I, as I keep re I keep rereading it, and it, it just gets longer and longer and bigger and bigger until it's an outline. Uh, to add on to that, we have another question from a listener who wants to know, do you have a writing routine? So we talked about like kind of the timeline of a whole book. Can you tell us about like a day in your life of your as, as an author, your writing habits? I'm still trying to develop those. Um, and, and, and that's because, like I said, the first seven books I wrote, I wrote on, at nights and a weekend, and my writing routine was once the kids are asleep, once my wife's asleep, once maybe we've had a little quality time together, it's midnight, and now I have to caffeinate myself and write until I'm writing really poorly. You know, and, and so, um, which might be three or four in the morning. Now that I actually do this all day, I have, I'm trying to develop healthier life habits and whatnot. Um, so, you know, I, I have to walk the dog first in the morning. The, I don't do it enough, but I, I, I live in between two lakes that are each like two blocks away. And, I, and a really good day is if, if I know what I have to write, I will think about it as I walk. I'll go take a walk around the lake, maybe sit on the bench, 
get a solid idea in my head. And then I come home and then I do the New York Times crossword puzzle. And I do that because I want my brain thinking about words and not thinking about what I'm writing. I want my brain, so I call it mental wasabi. I need mental wasabi to try to cleanse the palate. And then I sit down and I try to write for, to lunch, say, and then do that again after lunch. So I don't know, what you, there's probably much better ways to do this that I will develop, but I'm curious to hear what they have to say. So I'll be quiet and take notes. Well, for me, uh, I'm similar to James uh, in terms of career trajectory. I worked for a long time while I wrote um, for my first two books. So I wrote nights and weekends. I would write from nine at night until like one in the morning. And so that turned out to be a good time for me creatively. And so now, even though I could write during the day, I often don't. I do other stuff during the day and then I write at night. But if if I'm in the thick of a book and the writing is going well, um, then it will pour out and I don't need a schedule. It just comes out. Um, and if it's not going well, I can't sit and force it. So I'm not somebody who makes myself write every day. I don't have word count goals. I don't do anything like that. I just know if it's not coming out, then something's wrong. And I probably have to take a step back and figure out what's going on with my concept or my characters and brainstorm with my agents or with some of my critique partners. So there's there's not a lot of structure to it, although certainly when I'm on deadline, I, you know, I will do all of those things a lot faster. <laughs> and if I'm not, sometimes I just give myself permission to not write and to consume other media and to dream a little bit. And a lot of times that, you know, whatever is holding me back gets worked out that way. I'm actually a little bit the opposite. Similarly to you, I wrote my first few books um, while I had a day job, so to speak. So I would write, you know, in my free time, but I'm such a morning person that for me that meant like early in the morning on the weekends okay. usually. Um, and I still am a morning writer. So similarly to Karen, I kept up those habits. I just do it you know, during the week now. But I tend to write, you know, most of my writing day is done by noon. And I know if I haven't had a good writing day, by noon, I'm probably not going to. Yes, um, yes. And I think this is another place where having an outline actually is really helpful. If I have a day where writing is not going well, but I have my outline, then I know what to do that day. So no matter, you know, the mood I wake up in, like I don't have, you know, not that I don't think writer's block is real, I absolutely think it's out there, unfortunately. But when I have an outline, I don't have to worry about that because I know what my goal is for the day is to write you know, whatever the next section on my outline is, usually it's a chapter a day when I'm working on the first draft. Um, so I, you know, I think I can't, I do have like a very, you know, dull routine where I just, you know, sit at my desk and work in the morning and, you know, do my, my words for the day. And, and then, you know, like Karen said, I use, I use my afternoons um, to, to consume other media, like to, you know, whether it's to walk around and think dream or to watch TV shows or read other books that end up, inevitably being research for what I'm writing. Also, I think, you know, um, and, and, and certainly all writers are different and, and, and you guys write probably older than, than, than what I write to as far as the audience, but there's a sizable part of the day that you've got to set aside for the business of being a, a writer, you know, whether that's social media, whether that's figuring out, you know, research plans or travel plans, it, it's not nothing. You know, so I try to save that for the afternoon when I, when, when the creative parts and it's like, okay, the, the, re, the return on investment of time is not yielding great writing here. Maybe now what I need to do is I need to look at some of these other things that, you know, the 8,000 emails I haven't responded to or, 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 or whatever that is. Absolutely. Thank you for those insights. Um, we have another question from the audience, um, uh, more about your outlining tactics. Uh, this, this listener wants to know, do you like to follow a specific outline structure, save the cat, hero's journey, three act, et cetera, or do you have kind of your own structure that you follow? Um, I don't follow like necessarily a particular outline, but I think Karen made this point earlier that like all stories kind of hit certain beats and follow um, a structure. And so I think um, whether like consciously or unconsciously, I think I do probably hew to that sort of structure. You, you know, I think it's dangerous to stay 
he, uh, it's dangerous to start treating things like recipes, right? You know, a, a recipe and an outline are two really different things. Um, I realize though that there is a part of my writing that is shaped from having written scripts and screenplays for 20 plus years, that there is a pattern, you know, that that's actually far more structured and commercial breaks and cliffhangers and things like that and, and, and the way that you write. So I, I think ingrained in me is already writing that. Also because dialogue is such a big part, I, my point of view and my voice tends to be more dialogue driven than maybe if I had a different background, I don't know. Um, the, the, the part of the outline and the structure though that, that's really different for me and shaped by that is I write like I would produce a TV show. And by that, I mean, um, I go and I scout locations. And like I would scout locations when I was saying doing a documentary and you go, okay, where do I want to put the camera? And where do I, where's the great, I go and I'll walk through the, like, like Cameron was talking about going through Boston. Some of it's research, but some of it's also trying to figure out what's the best place to do it and how should we do it? And, and I remember I'd be on shows because I worked in kids TV every now and then the writers would get caught in an elevator with a parent, which was the worst right, the parent of one of the cast members. And it's like, you're not giving X, Y, Z enough scenes. And how come you always write for her and not for him and, and this kind of stuff. And I find myself having arguments with, not arguments, discussions with the parents and the agents of my cast, of my characters. Like, you know, so-and-so thinks that you're not using her enough, you know, and it's not like I really have that, but it's like that mindset is such, and the outline is like, you know what? because usually when those parents came to you, the way they did it was wrong, but what they were saying was actually accurate. And, and, and it's because they have the vested interest of watching one of 20 cast members, you know? And so I try to remind myself, so the outlining process from film and television dramatically impacts how I do it. I don't know a lot of the terms when people talk about like heroic and, and this, this, um, format or this this archetype or whatever because I just never learned that phrasing. I'm sure I do some of that stuff without realizing it. Yeah, for me, the, the first beat sheet I ever downloaded was Save the Cat. So that's what I started with, but I've modified it so much that it's kind of my own thing now. And the big thing for me is not just plotting out the plot moments, but the character moments and particular like emotional beats that I know I want them to go through. And, you know, where can I fit that in and how does that move the plot forward? So that's how I spend a lot of my planning time is figuring out how the plot and the characters work together. You know, you know something I really admire about Karen's writing is her resistance to do that, to do to fall into the trap of of an archetypal kind of version of doing this? You know, one of us is lying is such a tremendous success that I'm sure there are publishers out there that could be just do that again, just you know, let's do this again. And 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 her resistance to do that is not only just great sign of her character, but also such good long term thinking. You know, because you don't want to fall into plots of repetition and, and, and things of repetition. So, so she generally says that, I mean, she, re she really does that. And it's, it's really a testament to her as a writer. James. We've got another question um, from the audience and I know it's, it's one that many aspiring writers have. And that is when you get stuck, how do you get unstuck? Mm -hmm. That dreaded writer's block. What do you do when as, as a few of you have already mentioned, things just aren't going well. So, you know, this is definitely something I have spent a lot of time thinking about because my second book was a nightmare um, for those reasons. I love how it turned out. I'm so proud of it. But I had to write that book three times to get it where it needed to be. And I do not recommend that ever. It is no, not efficient, nor is it fun. So, a lot of my life since then has been geared toward never doing that again, you know? And what I have come to realize is, you know, there's sometimes there's a certain point in the story 
where I know it's not going right. And I ignored that voice um, with Two Can Keep a Secret. I no longer ignore that voice. It, I consider that an emergency. <laughs> I put out an APB. I talk to my agent. I talk to my friends. I rethink everything. Um, with my sixth book, I hit that point and rethinking everything ended up creating completely new main characters because it was just wrong. <laughs> so sometimes I think you need to listen to your gut um, and you need to have a good support system. You know, if you're not agented right now, that can just be your friends, you know, or your family or people who you trust to talk through and brainstorm with. I mean, I think for me, sometimes walking away from something that isn't working can be really helpful. Like whether it's something that isn't working in the moment and I just need a break from it and I can go back to it the next day or a few days later and then it is working. Um, or if it's something I need to walk away from that project and say, okay, this was an idea that I was super excited about, but for whatever reason this idea is not turning into what I hoped it would and I have to let that go. Like with um, my book, The Castle School, that was actually an idea that I had back in, I think, 2012 or 2013. And I started, you know, working on it and making notes around it and it wasn't working. And I just, I, I had been, go I was going in a different direction that was like fantasy and it just wasn't working. And I eventually had to let that go. And I think, you know, like a lot of writers, I thought, oh, I'll go back to that someday. You know, I still love that idea. And I can tell you like 90% of the time, I don't go back to the things that I say that about. But this was one I did go back to. And when I came back, even though it was years later, I was like, now I know how to tell the story. It was the same premise and the same spark of an idea, but a totally different structure and world. So I think um, sometimes you have to allow yourself to the, the freedom to walk away and say, this isn't working. Doesn't mean I failed. I learned a lot from, from this attempt and it's gonna, it's gonna apply in whatever I write next. And maybe it will have a life down the line, maybe it won't. But you know, walking away from that idea is what allowed me to then finish it a few years later. So, so I, I think giving and, and just giving yourself the freedom to sometimes like walk away and watch some TV and and let somebody else's voice fill your head and somebody else's creativity fill your head. I think is also really really helpful. You know, for me, there's a couple of analogies for writer's block and things like that. One is cereal. Like if I go into the kitchen looking for cereal, I only have two options. It's really easy to pick. But when I'm grocery shopping, there's 50 boxes of cereal to choose from. Sometimes it's, none of them sound right. And I think that's a lot of times writer's block is not the lack of ideas, but it's like, well, that's okay. And that's, and, and you just kind of have to work through that um, and realize that it's not perfect, you know, but you can pick one and see how it goes. But it's also sometimes like a trip. And sometimes like you'll be on a trip and usually I drive, my wife doesn't, because she doesn't want she likes to sleep in the car. But she'll say, you know, when we're like on a family trip somewhere, she's like, shouldn't you have gone a different direction back there? And rather than being the person who just keeps driving on, you want to pull over and say, okay, well, this is, you know, should I have taken that road? And that's a lot of times what it is, really. I think it's, it's your writing brainstem telling you, wait a minute, did you maybe take a wrong turn? And I'm going to stop you. So you can regroup enough to realize because it's a lot harder to go back two chapters later, you know, or, or, or whatever. But um, the one trick that I have used, and this was more when I was in the late night writing, um, is when I would get really stuck in, so say it's like two in the morning, I would, um, I would get out of my house and I'd walk across the street. And I, I, I would look at the house and I would tell myself, well, you can write, you, you, you know, we have a place to live and we're eating because you're writing, right? You know, so so obviously you, you can do this to a degree. But more importantly, that house is quiet now because your wife and children are asleep and they're only able to sleep because they think you know what you're doing. Because you have convinced them that you know how to do this and you have put everyone's eggs in your basket and you better go and live up to what they expect out of you. And I would stand there and I'd look at the house for 20 seconds and I'd walk back in and I'd start writing. And, and, and it was more, I think, just a matter of confidence boost, but also an acceptance of this is what you're doing. And it's not all going to be brainstorms and witty repartee with, you know, around the Algonquin round table. Some of it is just grinding in a chair and working. And you can't fix it until you put <laughs> the paper to work with. 
Those are all really awesome tips. Thank you so much. I know all of our aspiring authors are going to try all those out. I know I will. Um, we have four minutes before the end of our session, so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, the last question uh, that we've got here is, um, can you tell us more about your writing community? Do you have other authors that you write with or bounce ideas off? I know a few of you have mentioned you know, your copy editors or your agents. Can you tell us more about, um, besides you, who is it that helps make books possible? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I have critique partners who I met when I was an aspiring writer on social media. So I've known them at this point for like six years, I think. And the cool thing is everyone is now published. You know, it took time. Um, we all had different paths, but we all got there. The tricky thing, though, is that now that we're all published, we all have deadlines. And so I used to have people always read my books, you know, sort of before they went to my agent or before they went to my editor. But now it doesn't always work. Like they don't have time or I don't have time. Um, so it's more like when you get to it type of thing. Um, and as I think you progress too, like I've always been with the same agent. I've always been with the same editor. You know, it's like a team I really trust and they know my writing. So I know that, you know, within that small group, we can fix a lot of issues. And then I rely on my critique partners to help me fill in, you know, maybe certain blanks that the rest of us could have missed. My, my wife reads everything first and she's a great editor, and she she doesn't tell me what to fix. She'll just go, oh, it's okay. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's not good. Um, again, our Rosemary, our agent, um, and my editor, I had the same, I had two editors, same place, same home the whole time. That really helped. And during COVID, I have a group of nine writers who get together every Tuesday night on Zoom, and it's an amazing group. It's like, you know, they're all much bigger writers than me and bestsellers and TV shows and all that. It's like, that's it. We're just bemoan the, pro the fact that we're not seeing people in person. And I think all of us are worried that if we get locked into the house and just wrote and texted and sent emails that we lose something. And so it, every Tuesday night for an hour and a half, it's the most fun of the week. Um, I have a lovely writing group that we've been meeting together for years. Obviously, we haven't met over the past year, but we used to be very good about meeting and sharing each other's work. And I also, in addition to my writing group, I also have a particular group of writing friends. I mean, I've had many writing friends, but I have this one particular group. And again, not during COVID, but prior to COVID. And a few times over Zoom on COVID, we would just get together like every couple months. And like James was saying, kind of just talk about our process, talk about what's going on. Sometimes not talk about writing at all and just talk about, you know, our lives and our families. But it just, it, having those people to talk to, to bounce ideas off of, um, to share, like, what this process is like and what the industry is like and everything has been just invaluable. I'm also part of a group called the Renegades in Middle Grade. It's like a social media digital group of middle grade writers. It's really fun. And we do the And what, what, what makes silly videos, like, we'll all lip sync the song Renegade by Stink Sticks and put that, you know, it, it just helps. I love, uh, the other writers are the most supportive, friendliest people I've ever come across. It's so great to be part of that group. And publishing is, you know, it's a great industry, um, but it's a challenging industry. The highs are really high and the lows are really low and you need people who get that. Um, and so other writers are just invaluable. And you need colleagues, like, with, you know, with a job where you're going in an office every day, you have colleagues that you can, like, you know, go into each other's offices and talk about what's going on in work. And you can't, you know, we think of writing as a very solitary pursuit, but I, I think of myself as someone who does have colleagues. It's these writer friends. They're my colleagues. Yeah. And they're also my dear friends. But, but you need people you can talk about your job with. What, what, the, the hidden mystery, too, that I think the special sauce of these kids writing is it's almost all women. All the decisions that... Editors, publishers, agents, everyone I deal with in every book is a woman. And it's just so much better to work with. And I went in television with all these obnoxious men that I work with. And so it's, um, I, I love that part of it. It's a, it's a really great celebratory, welcoming, broadly thinking, macroscopic look at the world. Well, I can tell that the writing community must be amazing because I have had so much fun listening and hearing from you guys today. Thank you so, so much for your time. 
We are all so inspired and so thankful to have heard from you today. That is the end of our time, but um, if we want to go around, could you just tell us, like, where could we keep up with new um, happenings with you? Can we find you online anywhere? Do you have a website? Anything you want to plug for us before we say goodbye? Yeah, you can find me at um, on Twitter and Instagram at writerkmc or karenmcmanus.com. Um, and my latest book is The Cousins. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Alyssa Scheinmel. I am on Twitter, but I don't really tweet much. So the best way to keep up with me is on Instagram. And my latest book is The Capital School for Troubled Girls. And it just came out a few months ago. And that's the one I was talking about that was inspired by the Prophets and Princesses. It had a couple of stops and starts before it became a book. Um, you can follow websites, jamesfonte.com, um, Twitter at jamesfonte. And um, my latest book is City Spies Golden Gate. Um, and it's a real honor to be here and to share a panel with such great, great colleagues. Yes, again, thank you so, so much um, to everybody listening. Thank you for being here today. And um, I believe the next panels, the next live panels start at two. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think the next panels are at two. So we hope to see you then uh, for more wonderful book things. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.